Physically, I was looking at the corner of a table, and let's say the table's 15 feet away. That means my eyes are focused at 15 feet. I could look at an airplane up in the sky. That means my eyes are focused at 15,000 feet. Or what if I was looking at the moon? Then my eyes are focused at ever how, what distance the moon is from the earth. What if I weren't uh, focusing on anything? What if my eyes were shooting parallel lines to forever? Well, I was expanding my world, you know, and Norman was, was a destination. It was a place. Uh, so let me tell you, I went to Norman way to hell more than I went to, down to the University of Texas. I, I had a studio over in East Dallas. This is the one that was right down the street from McManaway. And I, have, I wrote in my sketchbook I don't remember what year it was, 73 maybe, something like that, 74, that I was going to have a show at a major museum in one year.
me, it's like a way of defining a goal. Here's my goal. I want to have a big show at a big museum. That's what, that's, that's what I want to do. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you got to get a museum director to look at your work and you got to have something to show them. So I prepared for a show that I didn't know where it was going to be. After about a year, a guy named Jim Harithus, who was the director of the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, he'd been fired from the last two or three museums he'd been at because he just was way too radical. I mean, the boards, finally, they would end up firing him. Well, the Houston Museum hired him because they were looking for somebody kind of radical. Great, man, a museum director's coming to look at my work. He came, he walked in, and here's what he did. He, he looked around and he looked around and he spent about 15 minutes just looking, not saying anything. And then he said, you're ready, you're ready. Do you want to do a show? I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I said, when? He said, in six weeks. No museum director is going to give you a show in six weeks at a big museum. The only time that can ever happen is in that radical moment of transition. He didn't go in to try to carry on somebody else's tradition. He came in and created his own. And he was looking for a clean, clear statement of there. He wanted something from Dallas. He wanted a Texas artist, you know, and I was the right guy in the right place with the right bunch of stuff to do it. What is the nature of this class? I heard it had an esoteric name. Yeah, it kind of does. Space and time. I'm sorry? Space and time. Space and time. That covers what's called forever. <laughs> <laughs> We just went from the bang to the future. <clears throat> Your shoes. At one time, humans were barefooted. They actually didn't have shoes. You're not born with shoes. But they learned how to put something underneath their foot and tie it on big leaves, leather, a skin. They put straw in it. This is my wife. Hold on one second. Ch Charmaine, how did it go? All right, thank you, bye. Never not answer the phone when she calls. <laughs> Rule one, space and time. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me read you a couple of poems. It's called I Never Knew. I hadn't read this in about eight or nine years. So if I stumble a little bit, bear with me. I never knew until the sunrise when the light layers came 
in measured spaces, hill to hill. True beauty comes in time, 300 million light years across, the best life I've ever had. Great gobs of flowers hang over the garden wall, visual pie topped with a soft hue, red and yellow. Kill a fellow. Where are all the snakes? I always thought the snake got screwed. Eve got the blame. Space time my ass. It's here and now, and the sun is shining around the edges, and the shadows have life about them. And rocks, faces, looking out through the houses of history. And sticks have power, swung round and round another full turn. And darkness comes. There is a quasar in the shoulder bone of Orion exploding on the horizon. No way is this just a fireball in its twilight. Adam turned into something less than that he could be, developing a king complex while sleeping in a suit of armor. The snake did okay, even though he was and is hated to the teeth. Eve became the juggler in a three-ring circus while firing ovens and wearing steel underwear. When the armored man was out conquering nature or just killing something. So much for harmonics and the balance of the neutron core. Blood red, midnight black, breathe deep, don't look back. Just like a man eyeing forever while his feet are stuck in plowed earth, just like a woman imbuing the stone, giving it life, firm, voluptuous, and full, a new now, another beginning. Please, God, give me just one more shot. I promise I'll do better. Guys, the only thing I ask is once I start, is that you just don't talk. Just um, at my mother's house, and she would be down sitting in her living room in her house with her son up drawing on her balcony, so I could not tell her not to talk. <laughs> and she talked to me constantly while watching the edge of night as the world turns and all my children and a menagerie of TV. <clears throat> and I learned how to tune it out. So I'm pretty good at tuning it out. But if you can just, you know, keep it down, it would be kind of helpful to me. Okay. What about pictures? Do you care? No, take no, them? anybody can take any pictures they want, except these guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to do a drawing called uh, I Am the Goodbye Glove, and there's more. I Am the Goodbye Glove 
where the big wave is the tidal wave and what you get is what you gave. The goodbye glove is like a way of signing off. I am now in my mid-70s and I have reached an age where I think about the goodbye glove, which is why I'm doing the drawing, you know, that at some point um, I will sign off and I will say goodbye and I will be in kind of that uh, mathematical role of the universe. <clears throat> This, may, this drawing may take me 10 minutes. It may take me 10 hours. I don't really know. And other than knowing sort of the specifics of the direction, I don't really know what it's gonna look like. I know my intent. And intent is really all I need in, in trying to make something work. Um, so my intentions are honorable. It may end up being, oh my God, it's it ugly, you know? But if it is, it's just the way it is. <laughs>
lenses were being developed back at a certain time in Holland that there were a lot of paintings that looked like they were done under magnifying glasses. I don't know if they were, but boy, there was some incredible one hair brush paintings being done and just so happened that the whole era of magnification came into existence during that time. It's, it's amazing that the airplane was developed in several different parts of the world you know, kind of semi-simultaneously, not exactly, but enough that the, by osmosis, it was coming out, you know, the era of the flying machine. Uh, I think that's true. I think that's true in art, you know, that when the time is right for something to happen, then it, it will happen. Artists will kill for a show. They'll sell their mother for a show. I swear. They do Oh, I'm gonna have a show. You know? They they love doing it. Well of course they do. That's what that's part of their the ego driven nature of what we do. So all of a sudden I was the imaginary director of an imaginary art space, but the space was physically real. It was real. I started giving students roles. I would make you my photography curator. I would make you my painting curator. I would make you my sculpture curator. I had like 10 curators under this. As an imaginary director, now we had imaginary curators. I even got people from the business school to be our marketing director and our I mean, we just set up this whole entire museum system. Man, Black Flag played in there one night and they tore the house down. There were 23 squad cars came in there and just, I mean, they drove right in the building, man, right through the big truck doors, you know. They arrested more people than they could haul off, you know. And this is on school property. This would be like this happened on the Norman campus. Well, of course, that was on Saturday night. So Sunday morning, man, it was full page. Houston Chronicle. The dean read it, the provost read it, the chancellor read it, the president of the university read it, the board of regions read it. I mean, I mean, everybody on the upper echelon of that school was up in arms. I had crossed the line well, rule one, after every event, regardless of what happens, you clean up, you sweep the floor, you put the trash out, you clean up. The next morning when you walk in, you, all the evidence is gone. You destroy the evidence. <laughs> that's, that's the way you do it. Here's the best thing that ever happened in my life. <clears throat> right up, this was over in, in, a, in a very high level Hispanic community, this warehouse. There was an elementary school up the street. There was a brownie, a group, a troop of brownies, little girls. Their mothers had come down like three weeks before and asked me if I would rent them our space to have this brownie badge pinning. Okay, sure, you can do it in here. You know, this was like a potluck luck kind of dinner. The brownie girls had on their uniforms, but their sisters had on pinafores and patent leather shoes and these dads had on cowboy boots that were like ostrich skin boots and they had on these glow in the dark suits. I mean, I'm talking about these guys are dressed to the teeth. This is Sunday morning. I don't know how many of them were Catholics, but I bet you a big bunch of them were. They had just, you know, most of those people had just come from church. They were in there doing a family thing right in the middle of it. Bursting through the door came the dean, the provost, the chancellor, and everybody, and they came in, and, and the chairman walked over and said, James, we really need to talk to you. 
they, they came over to fire me. Okay, they came over to get, they were going to skin me alive. I said, oh, George, I said, just, just a minute. This will be over in just a minute. So they finished giving the little girls their badges. You know, they all got pinned. Everybody was clapping and they're happy. And then they all started eating. And then I walked over and I said, yeah, George, what can I do for you? And the chancellor said, well, uh, 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 Mr. Searles, we, we, uh, uh, we, well, uh, we, we, we just wanted to come over for a visit. And they left. You know, it was like, really? You know? In a place like that, you can do anything. I think that's the lifeblood of art, to, to be honest with you. I think there should be something of that nature where an artist can absolutely take a chance. The person in charge of that thing should, if somebody walked up and said, look, I want to stand on my head for uh, an hour and a half out here and, and balance on a red rubber ball, you should say, okay, sounds great. In addition to major exhibitions throughout the United States, he has large works that have been commissioned in cities such as Singapore, Houston, New York City, and Hollywood. Please help me in welcoming award-winning sculptor, James Searles. <clears throat> well, to uh, say this is an honor would be a real understatement. I was indeed born across on the other side of the Red River in the early 40s, where my mother used to bathe us in a number five wash tub. Uh, I remember growing up with no running water, you know, quite the humble beginning, yet 70 plus years later, you know, here I am being honored in the midst of um, this, this place. It's, it's, it's a great, great honor for me. I have a few slides to show. The first four or five or six of the slides are works that showed here in, in, in this museum back in the uh, mid-80s. Mid and I was looking at pictures today taken at the opening of that exhibition back in 1986. And it was amazing seeing how thin and handsome I was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how beautiful uh, my wife was and still is. So, you know, but who am I influenced the most by? To tell you the truth, it would be a psychological person like Charmaine. Charmaine is the most influential artist on me, not just because of her art, but because of her thinking, how she thinks about things. That really influenced me greatly. What happens if I can't come back? I mean, what happens if I get over there and I can't come back? Boy, that would be bad. I like coming back as much as I like going out there. But I have to have some place to come back to. A safe zone? A physical safe zone? Yeah. A physical safe zone really is constructed by a mental safe zone. I found in her a safe zone, a place for me to come back to.
exhibition is called Distinguished Visiting Artist James Searles. It opened today. It includes drawings and sculptures such as Walking Through the Thorn Vine, which towers more than 11 feet tall. And Mr. Searles is with us now. Uh, it's been, uh, I know, a memorable week for you, sir. What's been the highlight of the week for you? Well, every day has been a highlight. I've been talking with students since the day I got here up until a few minutes before I came over here. So, and it's really, really a lot of fun. Uh, I've, I've totally enjoyed it. So, but it's a kind of a morning till night endeavor all day, all day, every day. This week, you've been giving advice to students at the OU School of Art and Art History. What sort of advice have you been given to the kids or the students? Well, now that's good. I, that's a good question. I have been critiquing their work. I've actually been looking at things that they have made. Mm-hmm and talking about it in relation to what does it mean, what's it for, what does it say, what is it symbolic of, what's it speaking about, what's it, what is it metaphorically um, alluding to. I also have been giving them advice about how you kind of become and maintain uh, your existence as an artist. As most parents would think, hey, it's a... It's a pretty desolate field, right? you know. It's hard to make a living doing this. And um, I kind of take exception to that because I believe that when a person is really doing what they love doing, they will get very, very good at it, you know. And when they get very good at something, then money kind of follows them like a vapor trail almost. You know, if you spend time on task with your love, you will get uh, very proficient at, at dealing with it. I have been asked before if my art mimicked the art of Southwest Indians, Northwest Indians. I would say no, it doesn't mimic them at all. But we fish in the same lake we, we swim in the same rivers, you know. I conjure out of the same skies as they did. If I'm conjuring from the green grass, the trees, the sticks, the rivers, the rocks, the blue sky, they did as well. We're just simply traversing the same source. We're walking the same path. It's 200 years later, or a thousand years later, or 10,000 years later. What difference does it make? That time gap? I'm closing that gap down to a conversation.